Hey, everybody, and welcome in to some of our conversations about deconstruction. Before we even get into uh, the topic and Lee and I get to chatting back and forth, I just wanted to set some shared context really quick. So first, I just wanna answer a few questions. Why are we talking about this? Um, who are we talking to and how are we gonna talk about it? So why are we talking about this? Who are we talking to and how are we gonna talk about it? So um, number one, why are we talking about this? Uh, whether you realize it or not, I know there's like a wide array of people who could be tuning into this, uh, but we're talking about this because this is a conversation not just going on in our world, uh, but that our loved ones are either going through, they have friends who are going through it, and um, maybe it's even a part of their current reality. Uh, their community, and we wanna know how to uh, love them well and carry on this conversation with them. There's been so many times where culture has said, you know, the church is behind in conversations or doesn't address what's actually going on in the world. And we, we want to be a church uh, that is not only aware of the conversation, but is a safe place where that conversation can happen. So that's why we're talking about this. Number two, who are we talking to? Uh, I just wanna be very clear. If you, if you tuned into this and you are from another church or you don't go to church at all, uh, I'm so glad you're here. I hope that the Holy Spirit meets you through these conversations, but we're specifically talking to New Spring Church through these conversations. Whether you're a part of New Spring Church and um, you have no idea what deconstruction is. I hope you learn something through these conversations or uh, you're a part of New Spring Church and you have loved ones who are deconstructing and you just need some help. You need to know um, how to be a loving brother or sister or parent in these conversations or you're a part of New Spring Church and you are currently deconstructing. Uh, we don't pretend to be able to answer all your questions um, or to fully explain the scope of what the experience of deconstruction is. And this is not a holistic case study of deconstruction. There's no way that we could get into the depths of it. Um, but our, our hope and our prayer is that through this, you would feel seen, loved, and that ultimately God would be glorified and you would know that um, we want to wrestle through this with you. So that's who we're talking to. And thirdly, how are we gonna talk about it? So if you are tuning in, we're gonna have three conversations around this. Um, we're gonna talk about what is deconstruction, why does it matter, and how can I deconstruct with wisdom? So this is part one of those three conversations. And that's where my friend, Lee McDermott, is coming in to help us <laughs> with the first conversation of what is deconstruction? Mm. And so, Lee, first of all, hey, Hey. I just talked a lot. <laughs> you nailed it. It was thank perfect. You, thank you. Um, but Lee, I just respect you so much and the wisdom that you have, and specifically mm. the way that I've seen you be a safe place for so many people. Mm. You've been pioneering a lot at New Spring for a long time. I mean, it's a new season. It's, it's such a party in every season. It's something <laughs> brand new all the time. That's why you wore True your flamingo name. shirt. That's it. I mean, my name is Lee, <laughs> and I'm here to party. Yeah. Well, great. Okay, let's get into the conversation then. Um, and this, uh, yeah, let's just start straight off with it. What is deconstruction? Like we said, we have a variety of people tuning into this, mm -hmm. but let's set some of that foundation. What is it? Uh, we, we were talking about this earlier before the this, this shoot began. Um, that, that term has become so popular, I think, in, in Christian circles, especially among millennials and Gen Z yeah. in the last you know couple of years, really, has been the, the frequency that I have heard it is much more uh, frequent, uh, much more prevalent in the last couple of years. Uh, but I do know that we were looking this this up earlier that it's that it is a term used in philosophy for uh, examining the the di discrepancies between text and meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our context, deconstruction really is the term you use when someone is maybe dismantling their faith or they're walking away from the church or from God or from Jesus or from Christianity or from some subset of any of that. A denominational thing or a you know a, a system of beliefs or a particular doctrine deconstruction is the dis, you know seems to be the dismantling of paradigms and thought processes and and um, you know that can be a a really revolutionary kind yeah. of season in someone's life when they feel like they want to take that journey yeah what I mean, like as you have heard it what are the what have been the context that you've heard that term yeah, I think that's part of the uh, the conversation is there's, depending on who you talk to, there's actually a wide array of definitions. Because mm -hmm. you'd have some who say, and this is, I have some friends in this camp um, who would say that 
deconstruction is a dismantling of beliefs that you cannot do within the church. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You have to completely remove yourself yep. in order to get just a completely clean slate mm -hmm. and like, okay, what do I actually believe? And I think if you put it in some, I consider myself, uh, you know, a childlike person. <laughs> And so if you're putting it in more like simple terms, it is asking the question, what do I actually believe? Yeah. What What do I actually, based on what my parents told me, the church I grew up in, mm -hmm. uh, the context I come from, has kind of constructed this belief system, maybe even for me. Yep. And I want to take it down to what I actually believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to put it simply, deconstruction, as we would say it, is the questioning or tearing down of traditional assumptions about faith and uh, reality. I do like how Eric Mason, he's a, he's a pastor, he says, this is the process of reevaluating your core beliefs or evaluating whether or not the religious system you were nurtured in is what you've actually embraced. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be in our context, in church context, what we're talking about. But I do wanna address something you said. Um, obviously deconstruction, the term is not a new term. No. But the way that we're experiencing it, specifically yep. over the past few years, seems new. Mm -hmm. I think it's new for the church. Yes. You know, that can be a real nerve wracking, kind of panic inducing thing for a parent, say, right. whose child is deconstructing their faith. Um, but it's a process, just like Mason says. Yeah. I, I want to ask something off that then. Because um, there is, for some people, whether you're a parent or um, can you even personally, when people are coming to me with questions that maybe I feel ill-equipped mm -hmm. to answer, why is there such a fear maybe within the church um, when people seemingly start to deconstruct? Yeah, I, I, I think some of the the most visceral fears. I think if you're like a a parent with a a adult child who is walking away from church or faith or anything else like that, there can be this uh, fear that your relationship with them is also going to be severed. Yeah. And so it's like you know if you grew up in church or something, if your parents are you know, big into church and you grew up in church, but you go off to college and you're like, I don't think I wanna have anything to do with that. Your parents can get really, really in a, in a sort of a panic mode because mm -hmm. they are afraid that somehow their relationship with you is going to get you know, sacrificed as well. They're gonna get cut off as well. But I think at the, at the root of some parents, you know, they probably just believe like, look, if my kids no longer believe in Jesus, I will not get the chance to spend eternity with them. I think that's mm -hmm. a very real fear. Or either they're gonna to begin to make choices that are going to bring destruction in their life if they go down this path to deconstruction. Um, you know, those are all some valid feelings that yeah. some parents have. I think some maybe some feelings that parents definitely do have that probably should be examined and maybe cast aside. Some parents probably fear a deconstruction journey or process in their children because of the potential embarrassment that it may cause mm. them. Have a like yeah. the rumor mill going around gossiping, well, did you hear about so-and-so? They're just like going off, you know, whatever. I would, you know, I think for parents that are in that, that situation, you, you've got to take your kids again, or your, you know, for whoever's in it, you gotta take these loved ones to Jesus and sacrifice your own reputation so that their journey can take its full course, yeah. um, you know, unimpeded by your opinions. Yeah, that's I, so good. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, but yeah. I, that's, talking about the process and the journey, mm -hmm. that is one th thing throughout scripture that you see Jesus in and of himself or even in the parables that he told, that he was okay with people taking a journey of questioning things, of yeah. asking the hard questions of, um, you know, the prodigal son left, but the father doesn't chase after him. Mm -hmm. He's like, call it what you want. The son needed to go on his own deconstructing journey, you know, in whatever context that was. Because candidly, a lot of my friends who would say they are deconstructing, they have no intention of severing relationships. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times it's actually the other way around where people within the church Oh, that, yeah. We'll sever those relationships. Yeah, and, and that's a function of the religious spirit tags teams with the spirit of division in order to split significant relationships yeah. and, to, and to get people apart. And ultimately that's what, the, uh, that's what our spiritual enemies are after, uh, along with maybe the, the 
uh, tossing aside of faith or you know anything else like that. It's the the, the destruction of these relationships. Yeah. Spirit of religion and division, let's say, this is a whole nother conversation for another day. Get them out, yep. Lord. Okay, so let's continue on just like defining deconstruction. Are there different kinds of deconstruction? Mm -hmm. I, th I think certainly it, it it's, deconstruction really has, it probably means something unique to each individual mm -hmm. who is on that journey yep. or on that in that process. Uh, I do I do think that the um, renovate, house renovation deconstruction analogy is is pretty accurate. I mean, no two homes are renovated the same because every home is a little bit different. And I think for each person who is on that journey of deconstruction, they're going to go into different quote unquote rooms inside their own system of you know paradigms or belief systems to see like what needs to be dismantled, what walls need to be taken out, what, you know, furniture needs to get tossed. I mean, like, you know, what, what things are there that need to remain, what, what doesn't. And so I think it's probably a unique thing for, for everyone. So yeah. you'll have, I, I know, so you probably have some people who, you know, for whatever reason, they want to throw the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. There are some people who their, their experience with church, they just want to completely test that and go off in a different direction. Some people who are like, this one, pro, this one subset of thinking inside of my belief system needs to go. I think, for example, people are deconstructing reform theology and going mm -hmm. in a different direction, or charismatic theology, yep. or whatever it is. You have all these little subsets. I mean, like, you know, I, the, the folks that you're walking with who you know who are deconstructing their faith, what is, what's their, you know, like what, what aspects of deconstruction are they going through? I think that's the thing, there's a wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. You have some who uh, are taking it down completely down to the struts and truly, like I said, truly feel like they can't do that within church Yeah. because church wasn't a safe place mm -hmm. for their questions. Church was actually the place that hurt them, Yep. that caused them to have to go outside and candidly, and this was another question I wanted to ask you, that there's a lot of people who would say I'm on a deconstruction journey who don't even like that the church is in the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, because they would say deconstruction, like I said, can only happen outside of the church. In order to get the clear picture, I've got to step outside of the church, which obviously like we would say, I would, I hope that the church would always be, and I know it always hasn't been, and I'm not just talking about New Spring, I'm talking about the church at large, always mm -hmm. has not always been a safe place to ask questions, to wrestle with faith, mm -hmm. to to deconstruct or unlearn or yeah. whatever. Um, why do you think that has become such a thing that people have found more solace to ask questions outside sure. of the well, church? I, I think it's a, if, if, if you can no longer trust the voices inside of the church, then you're not going to be able to hear anybody who's on the on the platform there because it will just feel like another talking head parroting mm -hmm. the same thing by the person who either lied to you or they had some moral failure, you know, or they, you know, whatever. Uh, offend, like if if the church has hurt you, there's an offense that's happening inside your heart right there that almost like puts things in your ears you can't hear what's happening there. And I think that's totally okay. God's not insecure. He's not. Yes. He's not threatened by that. And um, if someone has to go outside the walls of a church, take a break from it for a little while. I mean, this, this would be something that would shake people up to say, I think it's okay for some folks to not go to church for a minute. Mm. If they want to go in with Jesus and wrestle with him and then make their way back. The, the tricky thing about a fence is that it can create enough of an earthquake and a disruption in your heart in order to shake up what you believe and get some things clear and aligned, but you don't want to sit in a fence for too long because ultimately it leaves doors open for lies and wrong thinking to, to enter in. And a person, I mean, we, we all know people who walk around offended and outraged mm -hmm. all day long. It's okay if that offense and outrage leads you into a place of healing and revelation and truth. But if you remain in that, it only makes you toxic for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to deal with it to the point of resolution. Um, so, so that's where I, I want to be clear. I mean, I would never be like, hey, you know what you should do? You should just not go to church and right. don't ever come back. I would never say that. Um, but the thing I would say is like, you know, if, if you need a break for just a minute and you're not giving up on Jesus, you're not giving up on your relationship with God, take a minute to breathe. Yeah. And then come back and listen again and see if you can hear better. Yeah. See if you can.
That's good. You know, deal with this. Thing. Maybe you need to go to a different church, you know? Um, I think that's so goodly and could be freeing for a lot of people because I do think there's, and I will admit to probably having done this, that there is such an insecurity within the church of losing people. Oh yeah. That we're not okay with them. Yeah. Going to another church, getting some time to go ask some questions, mm -hmm. um, to take a little bit of a break. Uh, but the, there has to be, the church has not always had the security that Jesus has. Yeah. I mean, the we've the not, church is frequently insecure. Yes. Yes. And church leaders are frequently it's almost insecure. like we're led by humans. I mean. But I hope that that yeah. would be, and I think honestly that is what I'm hoping is happening in the church. Our church, the church at large, is this posture of repentance. Mm -hmm. We are so sorry if this has not been a place where yep. you could wrestle with this. Yeah. We're so sorry that our insecurity may have fueled yeah. just with people's real wrestling yes. of answering their questions with, maybe you should just, hey, just spend more time in prayer. Just read more Bible. Just go to another group. Mm -hmm. um, instead of, we're not always good at the long journey with people. Oh yeah. Of, of walking that with them, even if that means we're no longer hanging out with them at church. Mm -hmm. We're building a relationship yeah. outside of it to walk yep. with them in it. Um, that I know I've not always been great at, but there's been, mm -hmm. God, I hope to be, I hope to be we, better at that. It, you know, for New Spring Church has plenty to be in continual repentance of. Mm. The thing that has been clear for me over these last couple of years, having been here from the very beginning, I was at the very first service that was ever a New Spring service, is that being a church that is 21 years old, we have expected so much of our church because of our size and scope, mm -hmm. when really, we, we really should be looking at our church and giving expectations of maturity based on our age. Right. I only expect a certain amount of things from a 21 year old. Right. And we just don't think about that in regard to a church that is this large, has this much influence, this much you know, sort of global footprint. Um, in these last couple of years, it's helped me to be able to give grace to this church that I love and That's have good. helped to build, understanding, you know what? We're 21, it's just now legal for us to do some certain things. <laughs> the expectations on us, we I mean, are heavy now, but also I don't ever expect a 21 year old to have all of their stuff together. Yep. You know what I mean? They're still in a deep process of learning and growing, needing wisdom and counsel. 21 year olds need to apologize a lot, you know? So, so here's, here's Lee McDermott, employee number one or whatever at New Spring Church. Like for anyone out there who is on this journey of deconstruction, if New Spring Church has wounded you in some way, I wanna take personal responsibility for that. And just say that I am very sorry for whatever hurt or offense or wounding was caused in your heart by our church. And want to just invite you to go to the cross with us and at the foot of the cross, let us let the blood of Jesus wash us over and receive his forgiveness together and just see how we can move forward. The thing that I've seen in our church over the last you know, you know, know, four, five, six years has been this acknowledgement that we were operating with such hubris and pride for so long. Mm -hmm. And God gave us such a, a humiliation, such a gift of humility through those, you know, like several, several years ago, that has landed us in this place of understanding we do not have it all together. We've gotta to be careful with how we treat people yes. and how we shepherd people. And where there is room for us to make amends, we've gotta do it. Yeah. So that people don't stay in that place of offense forever. You know what I mean? And we can do what, what we can in order to help people on a journey mm -hmm. of deconstruction. So That's so anyway, good. We yeah. have been, yeah. So what it is sounding like and I think this is, when it comes to deconstruction, people need to see this is not as simple as a heretical thing no, yeah. or an orthodox thing. Mm -hmm. um, we even, I mean, you see- It's not one size fits all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you even see Jesus did this mm -hmm. some throughout scripture, right? There were things that had been constructed in the Jewish faith that he used scripture to then challenge how the church had manipulated- Sure. Authority, And one of the things in this conversation, one of the things that I have realized is that Jesus gives us a, the right way, the right kind of context for testing your own faith. 
It's like Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, you see this in Matthew chapter four, is taken out in the wilderness and he is tested by the enemy yeah. with these three different tests. And really Jesus has to deconstruct, he has to like break all of his own faith down to these be three bedrock statements. Man does not live by bread alone, mm -hmm. but by every word you know, comes from the mouth of God. You will have no other gods before me. You will not put the Lord your God to the test. I mean, he, he's quoting scriptures in a way that just shows the foundation of his faith house yeah. was based on God's word, not someone else's opinion, not yes. the oral law, not something he had been preached at some point. It was in the text, you know, and He's able to withstand the greatest, you know, temptations that have that have come. He's able to withstand that deconstruction, that testing, and that's that's been a great example to me when I think about in my own journey of being disappointed by leaders who fail, yeah. being disappointed in myself, uh, being betrayed by people, you know, watching folks I pour my life into walk away. I come back to those three things of like, okay, man doesn't live by bread alone about every word that comes from the mouth of God, no other gods before him. I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. I think the thread of deconstruction is right there in the mm -hmm. scriptures. And uh, so that's really, that's really beautiful. Yeah. Lee, thank you so much. I just, I'm so thankful for the man of the word that you are, the, the tone and the posture that you come with. I, I don't think I've ever left a conversation with you and felt less loved, mm. but more loved. And so for everybody else that's, you know, I, I want to just end this time by speaking a blessing over you. Again, whatever context or background you come from, this is from Romans 15, 13. And, and our true prayer through all of this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May you be blessed with the overflowing gift of hope in Jesus' name.